Hey everyone, welcome to Silver Creek Fellowship. My name's Corey and I'm one of the pastors here. Thanks for being with us today. Our Thursday church preaching series is on the parables of Jesus. These messages are from services that happened at Silver Creek Fellowship in 2018. Even though they were intended for a live audience a couple of years ago, we believe the truth in these messages is still relevant and helpful for us today. Tonight, we're going to worship by singing a few songs together. We're going to learn from the Bible, but right now, at this moment, I want to encourage you to participate by giving. We're helping more people than ever through ministries like our Mission of Hope Food Pantry. We're working together to make sure people are spiritually healthy through this difficult time, and we're doing our best to serve those around us and share Jesus' love. We've had people make first-time commitments to follow Jesus, and new people that have joined our church even during this unique time. I want to encourage you right now to take a moment and give to support what God is doing here through our church. If you're watching live with us, you can click in the giving box in the chat. It won't interrupt your view of the service, so you can do it right now. You can also give at any time by visiting scf.tv giving or mailing your check to P.O. Box 8 in Silverton. If you're interested in giving help to one of our ministries in Silverton, visit scf.tv and click the Give Help button. Please fill out a connection card tonight, and if you'd like prayer during this service, click on the live prayer button, and one of our prayer team will pray with you right now. We're going to worship. Let's lift our voices together and sing, because our God is great, and He is worthy of our praise. I was buried beneath shame who could carry that kind of weight it was my turn till I
All praises to the only giver of life, our maker. The gates are open wide. We worship you. Come see what love has done. Amazing. He bought us with his blood. Our Savior. The cross is over. last few weeks, I've been trying to think of after Easter, you know, we have this period of time. What is it that on Thursday night I really want to do that I want to try to tackle? And, uh, and so for the next however many weeks on Thursday night, we're going to dive into the parables of Jesus. Um, we're going to look at a lot of it, the different parables. Um, and I'm so excited about this because Jesus was an absolute master storyteller. He was so good at connecting stories to situations and circumstances and helping people who were uh, wanting to know more, to wanting to understand more, to be able to grow and to learn. Um, and I want to do that same thing. It's amazing. Jesus actually, early in his ministry, he's speaking. He's speaking to large crowds. Crowds are gathering. And as crowds gathered, lots of problems gathered too. The, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, started to look for ways to get Jesus, to trap Jesus, to poke holes in Jesus. Jesus' teaching. And at that time, Jesus starts to teach more and more in parables. And as he speaks more and more in parables, he tells us in the book of Matthew that the reason he's doing it is because he, actually these people who are looking for reasons to, to, to accuse Jesus, they're actually not going to understand what the parables are all about. One of the coolest things is the disciples and people who want to know, Jesus takes the time and he sits down with them and he brings these uh, understanding and explanation of the parables. Now, if you are hoping that you're going to come here and we're going to give you the one and only true interpretation of each parable, you've come to the wrong place. Because one of the things I think is so cool about the parables is that they're so full of truth, so full of, of exciting, wonderful kingdom realities that I could speak tonight on the Good Samaritan, which I'm going to, and then next week we could have somebody else come, and next week we could have somebody else come, and each time we could get these wonderful kingdom of God truths 
out of these same wonderful rich stories that Jesus told us because he told these stories so that these kingdom principles could be um, clearly and easily uh, understood and displayed. Now, this title, The Good Samaritan, is one we all are pretty familiar with, isn't it? It's so popular in our culture, this idea of a good Samaritan. We even have good Samaritan laws that protect people who are trying to do good in case something bad happens. Like if you're doing CPR on somebody and they pass away, the family can't sue you because the good Samaritan laws protect you in that case. If everywhere you go, I had surgery in Portland at Legacy Good Samaritan Hospital. And we have uh, every charity of every different type connects to this idea of the Good Samaritan. I even found online this week a Good Samaritan donkey refuge, which saves unwanted donkeys. This idea of Good Samaritans is everywhere. Now, that's a really cool thing, but it also means that it can, it can just pass over us. It can lose its meaning. It, it, it can be said so many times in so many different ways and applied to donkeys enough times that we start to think... Um, This Good Samaritan story can get watered down in our thinking. When Jesus told this story a couple of thousand years ago, this story would have been totally unsettling, totally disorienting. It would have been very uncomfortable for the people who were listening. If you could have been a fly on the wall the day that Jesus told this story, I don't think it would have been just like, oh, that's... Nice story, Jesus. This is great. No, he was actually, um, really, as we're going to look at tonight, he was going after deep-seated, long-standing prejudices and racisms that existed in their culture, and it would have been a lot of tension as Jesus told it. Okay, so we're going to jump right in. We're going to start in, from the book of Luke, uh, chapter 10, looking in verse 25. It says that one day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? Okay, so now several different times in scripture, this same type of thing happens. We get an expert in the law who comes to Jesus with a test, with a trap, a way to expose Jesus. See, this man, this expert, your translation might have used the word lawyer. This man would have from early days of his life, from his youth, began rigorously memorizing and studying the books of the law and the Old Testament. He would have committed to memory most, if not all, of the books of the law. And he would have sat under the teachings of rabbis and Pharisees and sharpened his understanding of the law. Now, Usually, these guys in the story immediately get painted with the villain brush, but let me just ask you, if you were an expert in the law, and one day, a man showed up to our town saying that he was sent by God as the Messiah and was the Son of God, do you think you might have any questions for him? I think we might. And so this man who had been charged in his culture, in his society, with helping people to settle disputes in the religious law, to bringing understanding to people in regards to the law, he comes and he has this question to ask Jesus. And it's a question that we see many different people ask Jesus all throughout Jesus' ministry, because it's an important question. What must we do to inherit eternal life? Now, Jesus, as he often does, responds to this man's question, how? By asking him a question. See, Jesus is a very good teacher, and he asks him a question in return. In fact, Jesus in the gospel asks his disciples 307 questions. Why? Why do you think he would do that? He asks them, well, who do you say that I am? He asks them, "Uh, what do you think? And see, by asking these questions, Jesus is able to drill in deeper than the surface question that was asked and get to the heart, get to the attitude, get to the real reason that this question is being asked. He's not just looking for to give quick, easy answers and people to think, man, he's good at this trivia game, isn't he? 
He's actually trying to expose what's happening in man's heart. So the man, this is his opportunity to demonstrate his proficiency as an expert in the law. So he responds in verse 27. The man answered, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Now, this is the right answer. In fact, earlier in the, in the other gospel, when, when Jesus is asked, what's the most important of all the commandments? What's he answer? He answers this exact same way. This is the most important thing. And this is what the man answers. This is the way to eternal life. Loving God and loving your neighbor. And Jesus says, you're right. Jesus told him, verse 28. Now listen to what he says next. Do this and you will live. So this guy, he's an expert in the law. He gets the answer right. He knows the right thing to say, but notice what Jesus says. Do this and you will live. What is Jesus saying here to the man? Is knowing the right answer to the question the way that we inherit eternal life? Is it going to get it done that he knows the right answer? No. Only if he does the very thing that he just said was the way. Remember, what is the term of the Mosaic covenant that God made with the people of Israel? Well, look at what Deuteronomy 27, 26 says. This is in that moment where the covenant is being signed, sealed, and delivered. This is what it says. Verse 26. Cursed is anyone who does not uphold the words of this law, how? By carrying them out. Then all the people said, amen. So they agreed. Okay. Okay, so Jesus says, good job, you've answered correctly. Now do that and you will live. And you can actually see from how this expert in the law responds to what Jesus has just said, that he got exactly what Jesus was saying. Verse 29, the man wanted to justify his actions. So he asked Jesus, well, who who is my neighbor? See, this is classic human nature. He's cornered. He's uncomfortable. So what's he do? He looks for a loophole. He looks for some wiggle room. See, for a devout, law-abiding Jew like this man, who is an expert in the law, his definition of this time of neighbor would have been very narrowly defined. It would have been defined to a small geographic area and included only other devout Jews living under the same laws, the same culture, and speaking the same language that he himself spoke. See, this idea of helping and showing love and kindness to people outside of this very narrow group was not only uncommon at this time, it was considered sinful. See, in fact, 150 years before Jesus showed up on the scene, a very famous teacher, a scribe who lived in Jerusalem named Ben Sirach, see, he studied the law of the, this is the time they've come out of captivity. They're now living in this time that's this period be, of silence between the testaments. And he's studying the law and he studies the prophets. And he decides he should write a book of wisdom that helps the modern Jew at this time to live in accordance with God's law. So he writes a book a second book of wisdom, like a book of Proverbs, but instead of it being God's wisdom, he writes a book of the wisdom of religion of the time. Okay, It's still studied to this day. It's included in in the Apocrypha. It's included in a lot of people's study. But I want you to hear what he says because you're going to see the attitude of the man standing there and the attitude of so many of Jesus's, um, the people who who are against Jesus's ministry shown here. Listen to what it says, chapter 12, the book of Sirach. When you do a good deed, make sure you know who is benefiting from it. Then what you do will not be wasted. You will be repaid for any kindness you show to a devout person. If he doesn't repay you, the Most High will. 
No good ever comes to a person who gives comfort to the wicked if uh, it is not a righteous act. Give to religious people, but don't help sinners. Do good to humble people, but don't give anything to those who are not devout. Don't give them food, or they will use your kindness against you. Every good thing you do for such people will bring you twice as much trouble in return. The Most High himself hates sinners, and he will punish them. Give to good people, but do not help sinners. Now, you can see that in the culture of the time, this prejudice exists so often in Jesus' life, because when Jesus is sitting and eating with sinners, what are they saying about him? They're saying, he must be a sinner too, because look, he sits and he eats with sinners. When Jesus helps somebody who's sick, they're saying, why would you help this person who's sick? It's probably because of their sin that they're like this anyway. Every time Jesus is moved with compassion, this is one of the accusations that's brought against Jesus. He's constantly being criticized. He's constantly being slandered by the religious ruling class of people because he's spending time with undesirable people sinful people. You see, they believed that it was shameful to spend time with these kind of people. Because God hated sinners, the bad things that were happening to them in their life was because of God's punishment on them. And you were just helping somebody that God was trying to punish. So Jesus poses a question. This question has been posed to Jesus. Who is my neighbor. But Jesus doesn't give him a simple answer. He tells them a story. He gives them an analogy. It says in verse 30, Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him up, and they left him half dead beside the road. Now, just for a little context here, Jerusalem, you could throw that map up if you want. Jerusalem sits, Jerusalem, it's a little hard to see here because the map is, I don't know why I use this map actually, but Jerusalem, where it says Judea, um, right up here, maybe a quarter of the way up, right there in the middle where the four roads come together in the middle of the mountain range, that's Jerusalem. And the road off to the right leads to the town of Jericho. Now, Jerusalem sits at 2,500 feet above sea level. It's right at the top of a mountain range. That's why Jerusalem is so strategically situated. Everybody, when they go to Jerusalem in the Bible, always goes up to Jerusalem. Now, Jericho, on the other hand, sits 864 feet below sea level. So that, go, no, That big lake you see right there, that sea, that's the Dead Sea. You know why it's dead? Because it sits so far below sea level. Its salt level is so high. And look, just to the north of it, that's where Jericho is. So in order to get from the city of Jerusalem to Jericho, you're descending about 3,000 feet in elevation down in 17 miles of distance. So it's a steep road. In fact, now, this is today... A picture of this road, these are just um, tourists walking this road. It still exists to this day when you go. And you can see that how sharp the cliff is down off the road and how vertical the cliff is along it because you're walking down this mountain spine down to the very, very bottom of the valley where the city of Jericho resides. Now, in the time of Jesus, this road actually had a nickname. It was known as the way of blood. Now, the reason it was known as the way of blood is it was a favorite place for robbers and bandits to hijack people because there's no way to run and there's no way to escape. You can see that, right? If, you're, if you come across problem on this road, you, you've got a real problem, okay? So this became a haven for violence, It has actually had that history for a long, long time. Off of this road, one of the canyons is known as the Valley of the Shadow of Death. You've probably heard of that. Okay, this road has a very infamous history. Jesus knows that. He's telling them a story about a place that they are very familiar with, that they all know, that they all understand. So Jesus tells a story 
that's familiar of this man traveling down the road, who's beaten, who's left for dead, stripped, everything taken. I can just imagine in this desert environment being there alone, waiting for death, thinking, will I die before an animal comes or will I bleed out first? Just how scary, how difficult this would be. But then there's a moment of hope for the man because he sees somebody coming over the horizon. It says, by chance, verse 31, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. Now, this is the first moment, as Jesus is telling this story, that the listeners would have started to become uncomfortable. They would have started to squirm. You see, they would have been familiar with this setting. In fact, a story about robbers and bandits and somebody getting beaten, to this point, they might be thinking this is going to be a good story. And now the person who they would expect to be the hero of the story, think about how many priests may be present as Jesus is telling this story. And now the priest shows up and what's he do? He's not the hero. He goes passing by. They would have assumed the priest, of course the priest will help his fellow countrymen, the Jew. And Jesus would confirm the answer that they were believing the who is my neighbor is other devout fellow Jews. But that's not the story Jesus tells. The priest sees the man. That's an important detail. The priest sees the man and decides to go around, decides to step over him. Now, I read a bunch of different commentaries this week. There's lots of different ideas at why this priest may have just passed by. Some say, well, if he were to stop and help the man, it would make him ceremonially unclean. Because if he had this man's blood on him, or maybe the man dies as they're traveling and the handling of dead bodies and their culture has all of these things attached to it. And a priest who wants to get to where he's going to serve God, to do God's will, doesn't want to let himself become unclean. Another commentary said that maybe the priest sees the wounded man and the reality of the danger of the road in which he's upon is such that he thinks, I'm not going to stick around here and become like this man. And so he decides he should just keep going. But you know what? Whatever the reason is, the priest makes the decision that he's not going to be inconvenienced, that he has more important things to do and he needs to get on with serving God somewhere else. So he steps over. Now, before we beat this priest up too much, let me just ask you a very difficult question. Have you ever done this? Have you ever seen somebody or heard of somebody that had a need, felt God prompt you to help, but then rationalize that because of your schedule or your lack of resources, and you just passed by on the other side? Okay, but there's still hope in the story because another man is coming. And maybe the other man is actually traveling with the priest, but in the story it says that the second man comes, and good news, everyone, he's a Levite. So it says in verse 32, a temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but also passed by on the other side. And this time, to make matters even worse, he goes over and looks at him. He sees him, and he looks him over and makes the same decision the priest made. I'm going around. Now, can, at this point in Jesus' story, can you imagine how uncomfortable the crowd would have began to become? Because who are the heroes? Who are the hierarchy of the religious Jewish society? Well, the priest and the Levite are going to be pretty close to the top of that tree. And now here we have a priest, and here we have a Levite, Both the likely heroes of the story have showed up on the scene only to leave their fellow countrymen without helping. 
And now Jesus ratchets the story up to a whole new level. Verse 33. Then a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. I need to stop and help us to understand how incredibly difficult what Jesus just said would have been for the Jewish listeners of this story. You have to understand that the Jews hated the Samaritans. You see, in Jewish history, there was a civil war that took place. And the byproduct of that civil war was that the kingdom of Israel was divided into two separate nations. One nation actually retained the name Israel. They were known as the northern kingdom. And the southern kingdom was known as Judah. Now, that northern kingdom, they were wicked. Okay, Judah had problems too, but Judah had some good kings that were mixed in with the wicked kings. Israel did not. Their kings were wicked. They did not listen to the warning of the prophets. And the Assyrian Empire was unleashed by God to come and to invade and to carry off into captivity the northern kingdom, Israel. Now, the Assyrians had a very interesting way of (coughs) overthrowing a nation. They would take all the men out of your village and bring their men into the village. And they would take vice versa. They'd take your men out and put them in villages full of Assyrian women. And what they did is after one generation, guess what? We now had a new people that were no longer loyal to their old ways. And that new people were known as Samaritans. They were half-breeds in the eyes of the Jews. They were people who were now intermarried with the enemy, the Assyrians, the people of Nineveh, okay? The the, the wicked empire of the Assyrians are now intermarried with Jewish culture of the northern tribes, and they hated them. In fact, the prejudice against the Samaritans was such that they would go miles and miles and miles out of the way so that they didn't have to walk through a village were Samaritans inhabited. It is said in the Jewish teaching that to talk to a Samaritan is equal to eating the flesh of a pig and making one unclean. The depth of the relationship these two had, to make matters worse, the Samaritans worshipped God in a place other than the temple. They had their own mountain their own altars, their own priests. And they despised the Samaritans. There was deep racism, deep prejudice. And now Jesus even says, a what despised Samaritan comes walking down the road. And the Bible says he was moved with compassion. Now this Greek word that's used here, For compassion, other translations use pity, other translations use love. The word literally is the same word that's used for intestines, for guts. He was moved in his inner being. He was moved in his guts. He was moved in the deepest part of himself to help. You see, this was more than just, oh, that's terrible, Somebody should do something about that. You see, the Samaritan saw a fellow traveler on the very same road that he was traveling who was in desperate need for help, and he was moved to his core to help him. Verse 34, going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine And bandaged him. These are antiseptics of the day. He's medicine. Then he put the man on his own donkey. And he took him to an inn. Where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins. Telling him. Take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this. I'll pay you the next time that I'm here. Basically, he leaves his credit card with an open tab and tells the innkeeper, whatever this man needs, I will pay. 
And then Jesus asks the big question. Verse 36. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. Verse 37, the man replied, the one who showed him mercy. And then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Now, I think this is one of the most uncomfortable moments in the whole story. Jesus is asking the man, the expert in the law, who knew God's teaching forward and backward to identify who the hero in this story was, to identify the one that was the neighbor. And remember, going back to the original question he asked, which one would inherit eternal life? Which one was obedient to God's commands? See, when I read this, I can just imagine the hesitancy in how this expert in the law answers Jesus. I notice that he doesn't say the Samaritan. He says the one who showed mercy. Can you imagine how difficult it would have been for him to say that? You see, this is not how they were expecting the story to go. See, this is the story they were looking for. One day, there was a man who was walking on the road on his way to Jericho. He was beaten. He was left for dead. And along came a couple of Samaritans. But Samaritans are jerks, so they didn't stop. They didn't help him. They passed on the other side. But then came a religious priest. He's a hero. And he stopped, and he gave up his life, and he bandaged up the man's wounds, and all we did it. But that's not the story Jesus tells. He tells a totally different story. The man is not able to walk away from this story thinking, okay, I'm on the right track. I help my my fellow countrymen and I'm on the right track. Instead, he challenges him right at the core of his deepest prejudice. Maybe this is hard for you and I to see how difficult this would have been. Because we don't exactly have this issue of Samaritans in our culture. So let me ask you a question tonight. Who is your Samaritan? Who is the person that comes to your mind that you don't like spending time with? That you don't want to be anywhere near you? That you believe nothing good can come from? Who is the person that you don't understand? Who is the person that makes your skin crawl when you're in the same room together? Now we could take the easy way out. We could go for some low-hanging fruit. We could say, oh, it's terrorists. It's ISIS. Or it's Kim Jong-un, right? If they invited you over to a tea party, you'd probably say no, right? We could go for that low-hanging fruit, but let me ask you this question. Who in this city makes you uncomfortable? Maybe who in this church? Maybe it's somebody who has different political views than you do. Maybe you wear a Feel the Burn t-shirt and they wear a Make America Great Again hat or sell them online. I want you to get that person in your mind because I just for a moment want you to focus on that person and imagine if I retold this story and made him the hero. How would that make you feel? How would that challenge your belief? Can you see why this guy would have began to become uncomfortable? See, Jesus has just taken this man's enemy and made him the hero of the story and taken this man's heroes and had them pass by on the other side. And then what's he say to him? Go and be like The Samaritan. See, three things I want to say tonight, just really quick. Three, and just as a reminder, when a preacher says real quick, it means nothing. I just like to remind you guys of that, because every now and then I let some of those preaching colloquialisms slip, and they don't mean anything. So three things I'd like to say tonight about what Jesus is trying to say to this man, to the crowd. 
And one of them, I'm going to drill kind of in, we'll go, we'll go deeper each time. Okay, so the first one on the surface is Jesus is saying that we need to recognize the humanity in those that we despise. Who is it that makes your skin crawl? Who is the person you'd rather not spend time with? Because Jesus loves these people. And we in our culture love to label people. That's like the, uh, using Steve's word, that's like the ethos or the ethos of today. We love to put labels on everybody. They're this or they're that, or they're this or they're that. They're in or they're out. They're, they're a part of this tribe or they're a part of that tribe. We do it in our culture. We do it in the church. Social media is just a breeding ground for this that puts up walls of division because you're a this or you're a that or these are what you like. And so social media then decides you should see this content, but you shouldn't see this content. And these walls get built up around us as we're further and further divided. But notice what Jesus does in this story. He blows all of that thinking apart. He says the person that you see as an outsider is your neighbor. God sees them as a son and a daughter. And that person that you want to judge or that you want to criticize, that you want to push into the margins, was made in the image of God. And he loves them. And he cares deeply about them. Let me ask you, that person who comes to your mind, what if Jesus is weaving a story of his grace and redemption into their story? The Samaritan is your neighbor. Okay, deeper. Number two. Radical love demands investment. I've heard this teaching many times on the Good Samaritan, and oftentimes the takeaway is something like this. Next time you're walking down the street and you see a homeless person, as you pass them, make sure that you give them a dollar and, and don't just walk past. You know, Make sure you smile, and it'll leave you feeling good, and it'll leave them feeling good because you've done a good thing. And certainly in the story, there is truth to helping people in need, to being ready to help somebody in need. But is that all that the Samaritan did? Did the Samaritan on his way by say, oh, man, rough situation here. This might help you. And then pass by? No. The Samaritan slowed down. Now, let me ask you a question. Why was the Samaritan walking the way of blood? Do you think he was on this road because he was going for a Thursday afternoon stroll? Just out and about, and he thought, you know what, I'll take the way of blood. It's nice this time of year. No, he was on this road because he was going to Jericho. He was probably a businessman. He was probably going to do something important. But he stops. And he doesn't just stop and look. He stops and he sits down. He starts to provide help. He takes the man up. My guess is the bandages that he provided for this man came from his own clothing. He puts him on his own donkey, which means what? He's walking now. He transports him to an inn and uses from his own finances, spends the night caring for this beaten man, makes sure he provides for this man's future. He holistically sits down and cares for all aspects of this wounded traveler. 1 John 3.18, John says, Dear children, let us not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. See, this Samaritan man, he doesn't just know the right answer to Jesus' questions. He stops, he sacrifices, he demonstrates real love. He takes deliberate steps to eradicate injustice. He doesn't just slow down and take a picture and post it on his Instagram account and add whatever trendy hashtag is happening in the moment, hashtag SCF cares, and then pass on by. He stops and gives up his own resources, his own time to help this man who's in need. 
Who are the people in your life that God is calling you to get down off your donkey and love and get dirty? What are the injustices in our culture that, like the Samaritan, move you to the core? And what would it look like for you to go deeper? Not just to say something about it or post about it or like a post about it, but to, in a tangible way, get down and help. See, radical love demands investment. It's not just lip service. We must invest our lives in the broken places and people of this world. Number three, and I think the most important. Jesus is what radical love looks like. Again, most of the time we hear the story, it's boiled down to, if you see someone along the road, help them out. And I think when Jesus is saying here, so much deeper than just that. Because see, Jesus also represents this Samaritan in the story. And just like this traveler, we all here today know what it's like to be wounded, We all carry wounds and scars from our past. We've all been affected by a robber. A robber, a thief who steals, kills, and destroys. And leaves people on the side of the road that they're traveling on to die. We have all know what it's like (coughs) to be ambushed by sin. And left on the side of the road. And just like in the story, who's the first that comes to walk down the road? It's religion. See, religion shows up. But religion isn't interested in broken travelers. Religion isn't interested in people who are hurting. Because religion is all about what you need to do to make God accept you. Look at the religions of the world. Look at what it's about. It's about getting on the right path and doing the right thing so that the gods will embrace you or accept you or you will reach some kind of enlightenment. Religion shows up and sees a broken traveler and what does it do? It goes around. But there's somebody else on the road. And where religion goes around Jesus, the outsider, who was persecuted and despised, who was marginalized, who was mocked, who was beaten and broken. Jesus, coming down the road, sees the man, sees you, and he stops. And he stoops down. And he heals you. And he clothes you. And he invites you to his table. He brings you to a place of rest. And he pays the bill for you. Just as the Samaritan in the story did. And he says, you know what? I'll be back for you. But until that day, all of your debts are covered. See, the gospel is all about a loving God who comes down this road, this broken, weary road, and finds travelers and picks them up and carries them home. Brothers and sisters, hear me. The answers to the injustices that we see in this world today, the things that make our heart sick, the things that make us ache in our guts, racism and sexism and trafficking and abortion, the things that make you groan, what is the answer? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, it's Jesus Christ and we as his ambassadors, you and I are now on this road and just like Jesus did for you, we are searching for broken, desperate, and weary travelers. See, Jesus came to seek and to save those who were lost. 
He came to take back from the enemy, from the devil, all that he was trying to steal from people's life and to usher in the kingdom of God into their life and into their circumstances and situations. And you and I, like him, now get to be a part of that same wonderful, beautiful thing. But church, one of the things that I'm so afraid of in our current culture and society is that as we get wrapped up deeper and deeper and deeper into our own bubbles and our own spheres, that we stop seeing the wounded travelers that are along the road. We spend so much time in our smartphones and in our devices that we fail to see the broken travelers as we pass by them on the road. And they're all around us. And they're desperate. They're dying. They need help. And religion can't help them. But you and I, as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, can come and bring the truth of the gospel, the healing, the provision, and the power of God into their situations. And we can see these broken travelers become fellow sojourners on the road as we go and look for other broken travelers. See, the beauty of this is as we pick people up off the side of the road, guess what? That was you and I too. See, unlike the religious elite of the day who thought that they were positioned better than these wicked travelers, we understand now today, you and I, listen, we're all broken travelers. And the road is full of broken travelers that are yet to find the health and the healing that only comes from Jesus. My challenge to us tonight, church, is that are we willing as the body of Christ to look past our prejudice? To look past our moral objection? And be the hands and feet of Jesus in the situations and circumstances where travelers are dying and need the hope of the gospel. Or do we find ourselves in a position more like the religious devout of the day that look at these people and think, well, they sort of got what's coming to them. Because look at the decision that they've made that led them to this. So, should just let it play out in their life. May it never be so. If God treated us like that, not one of us would be here. He reached down and grabbed you while you were dead and in the pit and saved you and gave you purpose. And now we are called as fellow travelers to go and to do the same. Jesus' last words to this man was, go and do the same. Can you hear that ringing out through the room tonight? From Jesus himself, go and do the same. So many people in this world are so broken and so need help. What can you do about it? That's too big a thing. You know, I'm just one person. Right. And guess what? The Samaritan was just one guy. But guess what? That guy was just one guy too. And he was able to help that one situation. Right? The immensity of it can be overwhelming. But there's one guy that I can help. And that's what I'm called to do as a fellow journeyer on this road. Church, I think we can change this city. I don't just say that because it's like the right thing to say as a, as a preacher. I think we can change this city. I think we can change the Willamette Valley. And I think through doing that, we can bring change to the ends of the universe. If we will do the things God calls us to do, and that is to help the travelers on the road. Who is your Samaritan? And I would challenge you tonight. If, you, if a person came to your mind, I'd challenge you. Let's get with it. Let's do it. Let's get dirty. Let's get down off of our donkeys and get down in the mess and see what God will do. Band, you can come back up. And as you're coming back up, I want to pray. And then before we worship, I'm actually going to we'll do, we'll pray for Ian here. And then we'll worship on the back of that. So... I want to pray, if you um, want to just stay seated, because actually I'm going to do one more thing before I have you stand up, and I don't want you to do the up and down like I normally do. So, Father, 
Thank you that you sent your son, Jesus, that he found us on the road and that he gave his life to save us. He didn't just pay the bill. (laughs) He gave his own life. He gave everything he had so that we could know you, Father. And Lord, I find myself challenged tonight because I want to be more like you. God, I want that that burning in my guts to come back because I've ignored it so many times. When you see people in need and you push it down enough times, eventually you just stop noticing. Lord, I pray tonight that you would take the scales off of our eyes, that you'd help us to see the people in our community that need your help, that need the gospel, that need truth, that need the Spirit of God, that need somebody on the same road as they're on to bend down and stop. Not just to to think nice things or say nice things, but to actually help. Lord, I pray the answer to this prayer tonight is this room, is these people, and that, God, we would engage with the culture that you have placed us in, that we would be transformational in this culture, that we would see people redeemed and situations and circumstances change because, God, we bring your kingdom to bear in these situations. Help us, God, to be your hands and feet, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Peace, bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it break. The sea to still, the rage in me to still every wave at your name, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear, Jesus, Jesus.
I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. Oh, I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. And I raise a
thank you for joining us tonight. We want you to be part of a small group so that you can be in relationship with others who will pray for you and encourage you. If you're interested in joining a small group, fill out a connection card and we'll be in touch with more information about a group you can join. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you soon.